of the most incredible things about the lambda calculus is that theoretically it's supposed to be able to encode any computation we could possibly want to perform. And yet it's so non-obvious. How can we use just functions and function application plus variables to get any possible computation we might possibly want to do? We're going to take a first step towards that in this video by talking about church numerals or church encoding. All right, so the most crucial concept to understand for this week's lecture is just how we encode the natural numbers in. So here's the first observation. For any natural number in, you can always write that number using a combination of just the constant zero and the successor function add one. So for example, I can write two as add one of add one of zero. All right, so I can write three as add one of add one of add one of zero. And I can write four by, you know, putting another add one here and so on. I can build numbers up starting from zero. So in the lambda calculus, we don't have add one and we don't have the constant zero. So here's what we're going to do to encode them instead. We're going to represent the number in as a function that accepts one argument f and then performs f in times in a row. All right, so let's see what I mean by that. Instead of having, instead of representing the number three by add one, add one, add one of zero, what we're gonna do is we're gonna take add one as an argument. So instead of doing add one in times in a row, we're gonna do some arbitrary f in times in a row. So let's do lambda f and then add one, f add one and zero. And also, because the lambda calculus doesn't have zero as a built-in thing, we're actually going to have this function f take some arbitrary argument to start out with. So we're going to make that zero actually be a parameter as well. All right, so when we take that interpretation, a function or a number in is nothing more than a function that then applies some function it takes as an argument in times in a row. All right, so this is our representation of the number three. And the reason it's our implementation of the number three is because it takes some function f and then gives you back a function that when you pass it in an x, will apply f three times in a row to that argument x. So we can get back our original three by taking this function, we have to call it with this first f right here. So we have to get rid of this first lambda. We're gonna do that because what function do we want to apply three times? We want it to be the add one function. And then we have to get rid of this next lambda right here. We actually have to give it an x. Well, x, what x do we want to start out with? Well, we started out with zero. And so of course, to get back into in racket to go from the lambda calculus down to our implementation in racket, we should be starting out with zero there as well. So let's see what happens when we execute this. We get back three. All right, so we're gonna start with one simplifying assumption. First, we're gonna focus only on encoding numbers that are natural numbers. The reason we're gonna do this is because you can use a very simple encoding. Any natural number in can be written in this form. You can write it in something where you have one plus one plus one plus one plus, and then ultimately zero. All right, so any number that you can write as a natural number, you can sort of write as a bunch of combinations of ones and a final zero at the end. So zero is just equal to zero. There are no ones in front of it, but one is equal to one plus zero, and then two is equal to one plus one plus zero, and then three is equal to one plus one plus one plus zero. All right, so the next observation is that we can represent a number in that's some number in the lambda calculus by a corresponding function. And that function is going to have a very specific structure. It's always going to have this form where we have a lambda f and then some lambda x, and then something that we're going to do to x. So we're going to represent the number zero as the lambda term, lambda f, lambda x, x. So this is going to take a function f, and then it's going to just give us back the identity function. The notion here is that we can represent a number in by a function in the lambda calculus that takes some other function f and performs f in times in a row. We'll see it imminently how we can get from this encoding back to racket, for example, if we can use some built-in operators. But let's think for a second, how could we actually represent numbers like one and two? 
Well, to represent one, it would be lambda f, and then it would be lambda x, and then we would call f on x. We'd be applying f once to x. The number two would be represented as lambda f, and then lambda x, and then f of f of x. So we're applying f twice on this x. And I want to point out, this is really where it starts to get confusing. So if you're lost here, I really recommend stopping, typing the stuff into Racket, and thinking about what are these different functions. Now we're going to play around with them and actually see how when we take this encoding, it's just going to work out and we'll see precisely why. All right? But you have to kind of trust me on this. This is the encoding we're going to use. So if it seems confusing to you, and in particular, if it seems confusing that we have these two nested functions here, I think you're going to see why as we go through. But remember, at a high level, we represent a number n by a function that takes another function and then does that function n times in a row. All right, so for 0, it does f 0 times. For 1, it does f 1 time. For 2, it does f 2 times. All right, but it's a function that takes some function f and then gives us back another function that takes x and then does f n times to x. All right, so I've got this number right here, 1, and if I type it 1, it's just a procedure. So 1 takes 1 argument f and then it returns a function, lambda x, that then does whatever that f is once to x. So how could I actually turn this number one, which is represented as a lambda calculus term, into a racket term? Well, watch what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna call one on add one, and that's going to create this function that does one of add one is equal to add is equal to lambda x add one of x. All right, so that's a function. And then if I take that and I apply that on zero, then I can actually recover the number one. And I can do this trick with all the different numbers that I have. So let's try it on two. Let's do two, add one, call that on zero. And then let's do zero, add one, and call that on zero. All right, so I get back zero. So I can write this function church to nat that takes some number in and then does n of add one, and then calls it and starts with zero. And then I can run that, and if I do church to nat of zero, I get zero, church to nat of one, I get one, and then church to nat of two, I get two. All right. So the next observation is that when we use this encoding, any two expressions that end up being alpha equivalent in their beta normal forms are equivalent. So even though this doesn't look quite like the number two, let's see precisely why this is going to result in the number two. So this is a big lambda calculus expression. Let's just start doing some reduction to it. So I can reduce this first redux right here. I can apply this function to this expression right here, this argument, and I can reduce that and I get lambda xx, lambda xx, applied to this entire argument right here, which I can then reduce further to just lambda xx, the identity function, which I can then just reduce further to lambda z, lambda x, z, z, x. And this is alpha equivalent to the number two encoded in this church encoding, because remember that would just be lambda f, lambda x, f, f, x. So even though it's a z here, it's equivalent up to alpha renaming. All right, so now here's the question. Let's say that I give you some number n represented in this form. So it's a lambda with this form, lambda f, lambda x, and then it does f n times to x. So assume that I give you some number m or some number n represented in that style. Then you know that its normal form has to look something like this. It has to look like lambda f, and then um, some lambda x, lambda x here. Sorry about that. Then we need to make this box a little bit bigger, then add another closing parentheses right there. So the question is, once we do that, let's say I give you this n. How can you calculate what n plus one is? Well, here's the key. All you're gonna do is you're gonna add one more f right here, all right? So to generate n plus one, what you're gonna do is you need to cook up a function that will have the same effect as this function, except it will stick one more f 
right in front here. So it'll do F one more time. All right, so how could we code that up? Well, how could I code up a function successor, which computes n plus one, and how could I write it using only the lambda calculus? All right, so here's the key. We're going to write it to be lambda n. It's going to accept some n as an argument. And then we're going to return, we need to return a number. So remember, numbers always have this form where they're a lambda f, and then they're a lambda x, and then they're going to do something. So what we're going to do here inside of this body is we're going to call f on, and then it needs some argument. That argument is going to be n applied to f, which is going to have the effect of doing f n times, applying that all to x, which is going to calculate n, and then we want to do f one more time to calculate n plus one, so that's going to be this final call to f right here. All right, so this is genuinely tricky. This is something that you really have to, the first time I saw it, I had to sit down and think very carefully, why does this get us the right behavior? Why is this the successor function? So let's see precisely why by looking at an example of it. Let's say that I start with uh, the successor function here, and let's say that I want to compute successor of one. Well, how would I actually write that? Well, I would write it as the successor function, this big blob right here, the thing I just told you on the last slide, all of that applied to the representation of one, which in this case would be lambda f, lambda x, f applied to x. Remember, it's this lambda f that then accepts a lambda x and then does f once to x. All right, and we're assuming if we're correct, the successor of one should be equal to two. So let's see if we're correct. So let's perform this beta reduction right here where I'm going to apply this into this. When I do that, I replace the number in here and what I get out is this expression where I've got a lambda f, lambda x, and then I have an f right here. And this is equivalent, even though I have to reduce under a lambda, I can show that this expression is going to have an equivalent behavior when I actually run it to this next expression because I can beta reduce this lambda right here, this lambda right here, and apply this expression, and beta reduce this into lambda x, f of x, all of that applied to x, and if I do this reduction some more, I see it finally results in lambda f, lambda x, f of f of x, which is the definition of the number two. So I can see how I start with the successor of one, I encode the successor function, and then I encode one right here, and if I just churn the crank, if I just perform a bunch of beta reductions, even though it's a little bit messy, if I do it correctly, I actually end up with the number two. So if we define successor like this, it's harmonious with our definition of the natural numbers by using this church encoding. All right, so that's how you do the successor function. Now that I've convinced you, hopefully, that you can write the successor function in that style, I'm going to ask you, can you take the same style and perform addition using it? So let's say that I define the function plus using this style. Now the first problem I'm going to run into is plus does not just take a single argument. Unlike the successor function where it just adds one, plus is actually going to take two arguments. But in the lambda calculus, there's no real way to write functions that take two arguments. So here's what we're going to do instead. We're going to write a function that takes one argument and returns another function that takes the next argument and then returns our answer. And this technique is actually a technique called currying. It allows us to write any function that takes multiple arguments and actually write it as a sequence of functions that are kind of chained together. So once we define plus appropriately, we're going to be able to define plus one and then take that whole thing and then call all of that on the next one and then this whole thing should compute, compute two. All right, so now we have to fill in a definition for what goes right here. It's going to be a lambda n and then some lambda k, and then we need to fill in. What do we put in right here? We have to find that out. So the key idea here is that we're going to return a function that takes another function, the second one, to then complete the work, all right? And this, this currying trick is going to show up in class a few different places, but it's good to kind of practice it here now. So here's the big reveal. This is how we implement plus. What you do is you say, give me a lambda n, which is gonna be the first argument, and then lambda k, which is the second argument, 
And then I'm going to return lambda f, which is that f that I'm doing in plus k times. And then I return lambda x, which is the actual thing that I'm supposed to apply in plus k times of f2. And then here's what I do. I call k of f, which is going to apply f k times to the result of calling n of f on x. So this first n of f is going to perform f n times on x, and it's going to give me some result. And then I'm going to feed that as the input to k, which is then going to perform f k times on the result of n. So first I'm doing f n times, and then I'm doing f an additional k times. And so the combination of those two gives me the plus function. So as homework for this class right now, what you really need to do, the, the way that I think you actually are going to have to understand this, is to sit down and with a piece of paper, you need to use this definition of plus to perform the following three computations. Try performing plus of zero and one, remembering to encode zero and one using the church encoding appropriately. And that should equal lambda f, lambda x, f of x, because zero plus one is one, and this is the church encoding of one. When you do plus one of one, you get lambda f, lambda x, f of f of x, because one plus one is two. And when you do two plus zero, church encoding zero and two appropriately, you should end up with lambda f, lambda x, f of f of x. So now we've taught you how to do successor, which is n plus one, and we've taught you how to do addition. How do you do multiplication? Well, it's actually very similar to the addition style. What you're going to do is you're going to do n k times in a row. So remember, n is a function that accepts some function f and does f n times. If you take that process of doing f n times and do that entire process k times, then you're doing n times k. All right, so here's what our multiplication term is going to look like. It's going to look like lambda n and then lambda k, and then we're gonna return a number, lambda f, that's the function f we're gonna do n times k times, and then x, which is the thing we're going to do f n times k times to, and then we're going to call n of k, which is going to do k n times, we're gonna call that all on f. So now we're doing f n times k times, and we're applying that all to x, which is then going to get us the necessary definition. All right, so now I'd also like you to go back and work out the multiplication for multiply of one plus one times one, two times one, and two times zero. And compare and contrast those with your answers for one plus one, two plus zero, and et cetera. So that's our introduction to church encoding. I think this stuff can be really cool, but it is very abstract, I admit. And so I think as a student, you really have to go around and play with some of these examples. Actually try performing the definition of things like plus and times and multiply. I've left in the description the example code starting from this lecture, and I'm going to let you play around with it and see if you can come up with the results yourself. And then in class, we'll be discussing and playing around with some more examples. Thank you.